by QO, European Bath Lounges. Let time wait. Protests and politics over the controversial BBC documentary. And now, an explosive China link to BBC. Was the documentary on Prime Minister Narendra Modi motivated? Congress dragged into Chinese conspiracy. China behind BBC's Modi documentary. That's our top focus on 6 p.m. Prime. Good evening. You're watching 6 p.m. Prime here on India Today. I'm Akshita and Gopal, and we're getting you all the latest updates coming in on the BBC Modi documentary. For the last many weeks, this has dominated headlines with protests for and against the documentary. But now a new claim has been made that there's perhaps a Chinese link that also needs to be looked into. Mahesh Jaitmalani, who's made and levelled that allegation, is joining us live in this edition of 6pm Prime. But before we join uh, him on the broadcast, here's the headlines. Adani Enterprises FPO gathers momentum, gets fully subscribed. Non-institutional investors portion booked 3.26 times. Economic survey tabled ahead of budget 2023. India remains the fastest growing economy amid global slump. Economy has gained what it lost during COVID. Ahead of budget session in parliament, President Murmu addresses both houses. Lord's government schemes hails Nari Shakti in India. उत्कल भारतीय के सपनों के अनुर विश्व स्तर पर आपने कीर्ति पता का लहरा रहे Politics are over budget session. BRS and our boycott president's address. Our calls president Murmu a puppet of Prime Minister Modi. लोगों ने राष्ट्रपति के अभिभाषण का बहिष्कार किया है और राष्ट्रपति का अभिभाषण वैसे भी सरकार के लिखे हुए झूठ का एक पुलिंदा होता है। Prime Minister Modi hails President Murmu amid opposition's puppet attack, calls are on opposition to debate and not just disrupt during budget session. Rastrapati ji ka bhashan Bharat ke samvidhan ka gaurav hai Bharat ki saunsadiya pranali ka gaurav hai And big statement by Andhra Chief Minister Jagan Reddy announces Vishakhapatnam as the new capital of Andhra says we'll move to Vizag soon. Here I am uh, to invite you to Vishakhapatnam, which is going to be our capital. I myself would also be shifting over to Vishakhapatnam in the months to come as well. In the biggest twist yet in the BBC Modi docuseries Rao, the BJP is now alleged China's link to this documentary by the BBC on Prime Minister Modi on the 2002 Gujarat riots, claiming BBC is anti-India. BJP Rajya Sabha MP Mahesh Jaitmalani said, quite clearly it's a cash for propaganda deal between BBC and Chinese company Huawei. In another attack, Jaitmalani said that BBC has a long history of spreading disinformation against India and that it best suits Congress's Jairam Ramesh's agenda. So the Congress has also been dragged into this. The BJP has also claimed that the documentary was being used to torpedo India's growth story. Now, these back-to-back -back attacks by the BJP also comes after a UK magazine called Spectator did in fact put out an article where they said that BJP uses funds of Chinese company Huawei for their overseas propaganda operations. Quite a well-known fact that several Chinese companies sponsored by their government have been dealing with the BBC and have also bankrolled the BBC in the last uh, couple of years. So it is quite likely that uh, the Chinese establishment, along with the BBC, 
with our opposition in tow is uh, using this documentary to torpedo India's growth story. Let's not forget that Rahul Gandhi's close confidant, Jairam Ramesh, has been a brazen apologist of the Chinese uh, firms here in India. He spoke several times out of turn when he was mm -hmm. a minister in the UPA government, including backing Hawaii, whose entry was questioned as a security threat uh, to the country if they were to be part of the telecom sector. I think if, if, um, if, if the Member of Parliament has got uh, solid evidence, he should go before uh, the, the appropriate oversight body in, uh, in England and expose the BBC in, in Britain and expose the BBC. The BBC is publicly funded by the, and it's got a, the, in Britain and has got a separate oversight body. It's a very serious allegation he's making. If he's got a proof about it, he must go before that uh, oversight committee and expose the BBC. This is actually quite childish. I mean, there is a, uh, there is a, a uh, documentary out there. If the government believes that the documentary is factually incorrect, they must come up with a counter-narrative instead of banning it. And in this modern age, nothing can be banned technologically. You'll always find a workaround towards it, and people will watch it, and people are watching it. People will disseminate it, and people will distribute it. So banning is all a very crude method, and to, to rubbish the, 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 the motives of the, of the documentary without uh, uh, actually uh, addressing the points raised in the documentary is also quite... Uh, uh, <laughs> quite ridiculous. If they really want to talk about China, they should actually talk about the Chinese incursions in Indian territory and the infrastructure they're building into land which actually belongs to us. Let me bring in Gaurav Savant. He's joining us live from our newsroom with more on this. Gaurav, you know, this is something that's no doubt going to start off a massive, massive political fight. But let's face it, this article that's been put out by a UK magazine, Gaurav, specifically refers to a Chinese company, to Huawei, which is already under the scanner for their links to the Chinese government. There are many countries in the world, ironically, including the UK, who've cracked the whip against Huawei for this. So BJP MP Mahesh Jetmalani taking the war on this BBC documentary right into the Congress camp, uh, actually asking a very senior Congress leader, uh, Jairam Ramesh, to come clean on links with Huawei uh, or, uh, you know, going to the extent of saying that BBC is actually peddling Chinese agenda or Huawei's agenda uh, or anti-India agenda that actually suits the opposition and then, uh, you know, giving multiple instances. It's not just one documentary, but you'd recall uh, till 2021, the BBC map would also not show the correct uh, depiction of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh uh, as parts of India. Uh, again, so what what Mahesh Jait Malani says, he quotes from that Spectator article saying that BBC for its overseas services, takes funds uh, from dubious, uh, uh, you know, uh, quarters, names Huawei as a company that's been banned not just here, but in the United States and Canada. In the, Well, UK, of course, has delayed it once again, uh, but uh, Australia, New Zealand, several countries, because Huawei, uh, even though China may officially deny it, but Huawei is considered to be extremely close to the Communist Party uh, of China, working on technology that actually helps uh, the CCP or the Communist Party on China snoop on Chinese people and on Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, so it's a suspect company. It's out of India's 5G story. And Mahesh Jaitmalani asks, why is it that the Congress Party, uh, and especially a very senior leader like, uh, like Jairam Ramesh, was at one point of time talking about Huawei, uh, their entry into India, and at a, at a, at a time, uh, the BJP has also asked uh, Rahul Gandhi, the external affairs minister, S. Jai Shankar himself, Dr. Jai Shankar says, uh, you know, they wouldn't go to the Chinese to get uh, the Chinese side of the story when there is a standoff between India and China at the line of actual control. You know, there have also largely been a lot of questions about the BBC being motivated, what's driven them 20 years later to talk about this entire issue. And through the course of that, Gaurav, there was also a lot of talk about the BBC's links to Pakistan and why you've got several, in fact, deep-rooted conspiracies in place that could motivate perhaps the BBC to be putting out these kind of films. So, you know, uh, multiple conspiracy theories, funding by com com uh, companies like uh, Huawei, which is out there in public domain, their overseas projects, uh, uh, you know, their, their story works, 18 Chinese companies, according to a report in the deadline, uh, uh, Chinese companies funding uh, BBC here, but, uh, or, or the pa Pakistan link, but the, uh, the, aspect that's being raised by overseas Indians is 
that this is creating disharmony uh, amongst people of Indian origin living in the United Kingdom and people of Pakistani origin living in the United Kingdom and the safety and security of people of Indian origin living in the United Kingdom in Australia, in the United States of America, in Canada, that's in threat. And is that BBC's agenda? Is there an anti-India, anti-Hindu agenda that is being being peddled uh, by the British Broadcasting Corporation? Because again, the government, the Ministry of External Affairs has gone to the extent of saying that the documentary was biased. It does not take facts into account. Uh, it's been made with malafide intent. You have lords in the British uh, Parliament who've gone to the extent of saying that this documentary is slanted. Uh, you know, it makes a lot of allegations. But the fact that there was an inquiry that was conducted in India, a Supreme Court monitored probe, which exonerated the Prime Minister, which did not find evidence against then Chief Minister of Gujarat, is, is just mentioned mentioned in passing or, or, or just virtually dismissed in that documentary, raising questions whether the intent is malafide and whether outside elements are trying to interfere in India's internal affairs. Is there a vested interest? Are these bigger games that are being played? So these are some of the points that are being raised either by overseas Indians or by the ruling BJP or even by the spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs. My final question to you, Gaurav, in light of all of this that has come to light and these allegations really that the BJP is putting forth, they're extremely grave. They're extremely serious because we're talking about vested interests trying to derail the country's reputation and image. In such a circumstance, what really can the government do about this? Because you already have the UK government taking a stand with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying, look, we don't agree with this kind of characterization. So some had argued that this is actually targeting of Rishi Sunak so that the British Prime Minister is put on the back foot. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, so these are British politics that are being played uh, using India or, or using, you know, India's shoulder, uh, so to say, or, in, or, or this incident in Gujarat. But then there are others saying that this is just the beginning of a campaign. Remember 2023, crucial elections in multiple states, 2024, uh, general elections in India. And, uh, uh, you know, there are, there are elements, at least that is what the BJP says, or some overseas Indians have been raising that point, that all of this is an attempt to, to derail the India growth story or to derail India's G20 presidency because this is, again is a very crucial year for India. This is our presidency of a very, very powerful world economic body, uh, the G20, and where the government is trying to put out the India growth story or the India story. Uh, there are people who are out to derail it and clearly countries like China, Pakistan, um, or, or even as some argue, the United Kingdom or elements in the United Kingdom are not very happy about India becoming the fifth largest economy, moving towards uh, being the third largest economy. So they want to derail the story in whatever way they can. But either ways, it's a huge debate uh, th that, that's been triggered and Mahesh Malani adding fresh fresh fuel to this fire all right and mahesh jit milani will be joining us in some time from now for the moment gaurav thank you very much for joining us here on 6 pm prime with those inputs the bjp lashing out over the bbc documentary yet again no doubt this is going to play out in parliament after tomorrow after the budget session when the opposition has made it clear they're going to raise this issue but the reason the BJP says that there's a conspiracy afoot is because of India shining bright in the world economy. Let's talk about the IMF projections. I'm at the global slump and several countries going through a slowdown. The IMF has predicted India to be the fastest growing economy, saying India's economy will grow fastest at 6.1. So from 6.8%, it becomes 6.1%. And then the IMF says it'll go back to 6.8%. And that's why the International Monetary Fund has referred to India as the bright spot amid all of the gloom. The IMF has projected that India's growth will continue to be very much on track and much more than many developed countries. In a world of financial gloom and doom, India is the shining light. The International Monetary Fund in its annual growth projection has given a resounding thumbs up to the Indian economy. Despite a global growth dip. The IMF's projection for India is a slight dip from 6.8% in 2022 to 6.1% in 2023. But India is expected to grow at 6.8% again in the financial year 2024. 
This means that India is the fastest growing economy in the world, with the current estimates surpassing growth in developed countries as well. Prime Minister Modi also referring to the IMF figures, hailed India's growth story and how the world now is looking to India to shine. Bharat ka budget भारत के सामान्य मानवी की आशा आकांक्षाओं को तो पूरा करने का प्रयास करेगा ही लेकिन विश्व जो आशा की किरण देख रहा है उसे वो और अधिक प्रकाशमान नजर आए मुझे पूरा भरोसा है निर्मला जी इन अपेक्षाओं को पूर्ण करने के लिए भरपूर प्रयास करेगी Looking at the figures, it's clear India is surging ahead, while other countries, including China, are way behind. The survey looks ahead to the medium term because the pandemic response and recovery phase is over. In fact, chapter one, the title itself says, State of the Economy, Recovery Complete. And therefore, after a long time, we have banking, non-banking and corporate sectors with healthy balance sheets, and they are ready to borrow and lend and invest. So we don't have to speak about pandemic recovery anymore. We have to look ahead to the next phase of India's economic growth process. While India's growth rate is at 6.1%, the projection for China is 5.2%. Other countries are feeling the slowdown. America will see a growth rate at 1.4%. The UK is struggling with an economic crisis. And the IMF projection has painted a gloomy picture for the country in the days to come. I would say compared to our forecasts in October last year, uh, the US and the Europe surprised on the upside. US because labor markets continue to remain strong. Europe because the winter turned out to be warmer than feared. So that has both helped. And then we have China. So China you know, moved dramatically away from its zero COVID policy. So we're going to have a couple of months where things are going to be very tough in China, but then we expect to see a rebound happening in China's economy. So there are certainly some positive turning points. The IMF's projection has made it clear that India is the only ray of hope in a year that will be difficult for the world. Get this. Based on the IMF's forecast, India and China will account for half of global growth this year. Experts largely have hailed India's growth story but have also warned that caution cannot be thrown to the wind. We are an attractive country. We are a country with 1.4 billion people. We have a per cap, uh, we have a GDP of 3 trillion. So you will see people coming in. Is it more incremental? And therefore, is the spending that we're doing necessary to get them in? No, even as we move to uh, a $10 trillion economy in, say, a decade or more, uh, we would still be $6,000 per capita income. So there would be a role of the state to protect those who are in the margins. So we are never going to open up our uh, vulnerable folks to the market forces because, you know, you never trust a benevolent politician and a benevolent market. Both of them don't exist. So we will have to have a mix of both. And that is going to be the India model. But we are going to do something different. India is unstoppable and surging ahead to achieve the $5 trillion by 2025 goal, as envisioned by Prime Minister Modi. Bureau Report, India Today. So let's reflect for you the numbers, the projections that have been put out by the IMF that shows clearly that India is the fastest growing economy over any other country. We're talking about all these so-called developed economies like USA, Germany. USA is at 1.4%, by the way. Germany, France, uh, Italy, all of them under 1%. Japan, the growth projections are about 1.8%. The UK, the United Kingdom, struggling, grappling with an economic crisis, is going to feel and be hit hard by the slowdown. And that's why the projection is in the negative, minus 0.6%. After India is China. China's growth rate is projected to be at 5.3%. India is at 6.1%. So we're way above China as well. Russia is at 0.3%. So you look at that particular graph and you see exactly why the IMF has referred to India as really the one that shines bright. The only, in fact, bright glow amid the doom and gloom of a slowdown, the impact of which you're seeing on all other countries. 
I'm slipping into a short break here on 6 p.m. Prime. Coming up on the other side, we're getting you details of the big statement made by Andhra Chief Minister Jagan Mohan Reddy. There's a big fight over his three capital promise, but he's declared that Vizag is the executive capital and he's moving there soon. respond are these charges that are in in should be investigated have they been investigated or do you believe hindenburg has brought out something new as a research analyst i must commend the hindenburg report because they have made a persuasive argument fully supported and documented with facts either from government agencies investigative reports or from the company's disclosures these have very rightly raised very serious concerns. And, you know, the eating of the cake is when you eat it, actually eat it. And it's very clear that the market has shown its concern and has gone and agreed with some of those issues raised by the Hindenburg report. And that is why you've seen such a severe fall mm -hmm. in the share prices. But, but, but what, are the specific, no, uh, Nadi, what are the specific... Are very specific... What are the specific charges that you believe have still not been answered by Adani's? See, the charge is this, that, and this is the main thing, when you have certain entities which are rooting funds from Mauritius, are they really the promoter's funding, which is what the Hindenburg alleges, and which is not classified as promoter holding? And where is the source of funds? Because they have raised some very valid issues, and they've given examples of certain companies, mm -hmm. where, which are kind of shell companies, which hardly have any employees, hardly have any business, mm -hmm. but they seem to be rooting massive amounts of money into the Adani group of companies. And the Adani group of companies in turn is sending monies back. So the central question in money laundering is what is the source of these funds? Now, when particularly they come from you know, these tax havens like Mauritius, mm -hmm. it does raise a very serious concern uh, because these are tax havens. They have been set up really to hide and disguise the original ownership of money. Now, these are the questions which the market wants to know. Mm -hmm. Now, Adani companies will be obviously very reluctant to part with any information because firstly, as per Adani, they are not related companies to the Adani groups. Mm -hmm. So on paper, obviously, they will not know what is the source of, of these companies' funding. Mm -hmm. But what Hindenburg is alleging is that actually they are part of the Adani group and they should know. So this is the question which I think people do not have. Do they support the Hindenburg report or do they support so, Adani? You have said that you are in the process of changing uh, or evaluating uh, the option of getting a global big sis audit firm for Adani Total Gas. Shah Dandaria is the current auditor there itself. Uh, by, by when will this happen and why, why are you changing? Is it part of a mandatory rotation or some other reason? No, no, both, uh, both reasons. One is that uh, we, uh, you have to see the Adani Total Gas. Adani hmm. Total Gas, Total is the joint promoter with us. Hmm. Total is a global firm. Hmm. They sit on the board also with us. Hmm. They have seen how Shah Dandaria works. Hmm. Do you think if they had an issue, they will not say anything? Okay. That's number one. Hmm. That shows you the quality of Shah Dundaria. Hmm. That it is acceptable even to a global, large, global major. Hmm. Now, our own requirement, our own development, our own growth means that we would also want, we are going to go for global issues of debt out of Adani, Trans, Adani Total Gas. Hmm. When we do that, we want certain comfort letters, opinions, which better that Global 6 is there because that comfort letter, those opinions are of certain requirement. They might have to require sign off in the US. They might require sign off in Europe. So that's where Global 6 will have presence. Okay. So we'll have joint audit. Now, when Adani Enterprise tomorrow becomes, it itself starts issuing paper globally, we'll look at that also. See, this is decided by business requirement. Adani Enterprise already has global law firm, uh, uh, accounting firms as its auditor 
for the businesses because adani airports issues a global paper already so therefore it has uh, grand fountain as as a as one as the auditor okay so 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 it is driven by business needs it is driven by your compliance requirements it is driven by what is that you are trying to achieve okay so if you issue paper in europe or in america then some sign off might be required in that domestic jurisdiction okay Welcome back. Andhra Pradesh Chief Minister Jagan Mohan Reddy has announced that Vizag will be the new capital of the state. Jagan has even said that he's going to be shifting to Vizag, and it's led to a lot of confusion because you had Jagan promising three capitals. It's a matter that's still pending in the Supreme Court, but clearly he's decided to go forward with his plan of Vizag being the executive capital. It's called the jewel of the East Coast. and with good reason the ancient city of vishakhapatnam will soon be the capital city of andhra pradesh apparently setting aside plans for three separate capitals andhra's chief minister jagan mohan reddy made the big announcement today here i am uh, to invite you to vishakhapatnam which is going to be our capital in the days to come i myself would also be shifting over to visakhapatnam in the months to come as well the move comes nearly a decade after hyderabad the capital of undivided andhra became the capital of the newly formed state of telangana since the division the city of amravati has been the capital Then Chief Minister Chandra Babu Naidu had announced grand plans to develop Amravati into a global smart city even bigger than Hyderabad. But in 2019 when the Jagan tsunami swept the Telugu Desam Party out of power, the young new chief minister said nothing doing. Chief Minister Jagan then proposed a contentious three capital plan with Amravati as the legislative capital. Vishakhapatnam as the executive capital and Karnool as the judicial capital. The We've been tracking all the latest updates that has been coming in on the BBC Modi documentary controversy and joining us now on 6 p.m. prime is Mr. Mahesh Jetmalani, member of parliament in the Rajya Sabha senior Supreme Court advocate Mr. Jetmalani. Thank you for joining us here on India today. Good evening, sir. Uh, do you believe, looking at all of the, you know, showdown and all the talk, debate over the BBC documentary, sir, that there could be a conspiracy, specifically a Chinese conspiracy, at play here? I certainly believe there is a Chinese hand behind it. I certainly do. Uh, the B BBC made no disclosure about this, right? Mm -hmm. They have not talked about their Chinese links and their Chinese links through Huawei. the telecom company their funding by this entity has been both long standing and clandestine uh, you know they've taken money from huawei for a long time and there's been a, a venomous anti india propaganda you know uh, com complete lies spread about the indian army's activities in kashmir as you know in 2021 they published a map of india truncated without yeah. uh, uh, kashmir jammu and kashmir and uh, the indian government took up the matter with them and they apologized and they got away that time right so uh, there has been both overt and insidious propaganda anti indian propaganda by the bbc for a long long time and i think enough is enough this country has tolerated this uh, a complete you know false propaganda for mm -hmm. a long time and they needed to be exposed right? 
Uh, you know, it's no longer a white man's burden. This country is out of its uh, colonial strangulation, right? We don't uh, accept everything that's said by, you know, foreign newspapers and foreign uh, television, foreign media generally. So uh, it's about time this happened. And okay. uh, the, the timing of the entire documentary is suspect, apart from the fact that the money was concealed. And it was concealed because not only are allies in Quad, such as the USA and Australia, mm. but even the UK have banned Huawei from 5G trials. The USA and Australia have considered them an Aust uh, a security threat, right? Yeah. Britain is close to the same thing. Yet, they escaped sanctions. They escaped sanctions from the UK, right? And they took this money, not in the UK. Huawei is now funding them through an entity called StoryWorks, right? The money is coming to that entity. So at home, everything is sanitized. But abroad, for the poor ex-colonies like us, you know, the white man's burden, they're peddling untruths, right? Mm. Which suits Chinese interests. And they peddle it because they can't get away from this. They peddle it because they are funded by Huawei. You know, I was going to ask you about, uh, for all of those naysayers who say, what's wrong with Huawei really putting money into BBC? I think you've answered that perfectly, sir, by explaining how Huawei also has faced several issues in several countries because of security issues and their clear link to the Chinese administration, to the Chinese state. There are many. There are protests, yes, Mr. Jet Milani, in London and India against the documentary, but there are many who also refer to this documentary as the truth. They say it's eye-opening about the 2002 riots about Narendra Modi, uh, completely discarding also what the Supreme Court has said. What do you have to say to them, Mr. Jait Malani? Ak Akshita, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. For the, the, the last minute has gone, has come Can you hear me now, sir? Uh, you know, uh, garbled. G yes, I can. I okay, can. I'll just now repeat my question. We've seen protests against the BBC in London. We've seen it in India as yeah. well. But there are many in the country who say that this documentary, sir, is eye-opening, that it's the truth about the 2002 riots in Narendra Modi, discarding what the Supreme Court also has ruled on it. What is your message to them? My message is, you know, uh, take your Supreme Court and your investigating agencies and all the courts who have examined threadbare, unlike the BBC documentary, right, uh, this, the entire evidence on record, Please familiarize yourself about the starting point of the riots, which is, and who was behind it, which was the Karsevak burning, 59 Karsevaks burnt at Godhra railway station. Please familiarize yourself, who was it, right? You will find that it was a Pakistani agent who started the entire uh, episode. It was a pre-planned conspiracy to burn the Karsevaks 48 hours before, right? And that gentleman escaped to Pakistan. Immediately after, he had set up the entire train burning uh, pr uh, prelude. So they should do their homework well. The entire uh, 2002 episode, uh, issue in 2023 coming up, ignoring extremely detailed judgments of many courts, mm. right, is a travesty of journalism. It's a complete travesty. This is a hit job. In fact, it's a hatchet job of the worst kind and the most clumsy kind, right? And you've been tripped up. Because, you know, you are now exposed as having taken money from an entity that will revel in the kind of material that you have published. Mr. Jait Malani, you know, you've spoken state. of a Chinese conspiracy. You've spoken about uh, propaganda, clearly, that's being peddled right now. You've also spoken about a curious Congress link, sir, about Mr. Jairam Ramesh. Why is it that you allege right now that there's a link between Jairam Ramesh and Huawei? So I, 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 again, got a garbled uh, version of your question, but it was something to do with Jairam Ramesh. I, what, yes. what, is it, what is the exact uh, I was asking, sir, why again? is it that you allege there's a link between Mr. Jairam Ramesh of the Congress and Huawei? I'm sorry, you faded completely now, uh, Akshita. Uh, Mr. Jait Malani, I apologize, but I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, I'll repeat my question. What to you is the link between Jairam Ramesh and Huawei, sir? Sir, 
I think there's a bit of a problem there with that connection. Let me just fix that. Mr. Jaitmalani, we're going to ensure that we reconnect with you because there's also uh, an allegation by Mr. Mahesh Jaitmalani there when he's put out a series of tweets about the BBC documentary. You heard what he said when he says that there's clearly a Chinese link that's emerged in this case, a conspiracy in this case. So you've got Mr. Jit Milani there alleging about Huawei saying there's no doubt. And you see the number of countries. He's listed it out for you when you just heard what he said. He's listed out the companies uh, that in fact uh, have uh, the countries that have taken action against Huawei to cite that clearly Huawei is linked directly to the Chinese government. And that's why he's alleging that all of this is a conspiracy. Also referring to the BBC documentary as nothing but clearly a hatchet job and a bad one at that, according to Mahesh Jit Milani. We're going to reconnect with him because we also want to put forth those questions about what the Congress has uh, said on this and his allegation that the Congress also is a part of this, at least linked to Huawei. This has been an allegation made by the BJP in the past as well, particularly about senior Congress leader Mr. Jairam Ramesh being linked to Huawei. Apologize, we've lost the connection with Mr. Mahesh Jaitmalani, but the Rajya Sabha MP there setting the cat among the pigeons by referring to the BBC documentary and saying that there is a Chinese conspiracy behind that particular film being released right now. I'm slipping into a short break here on 6 p.m. Prime. Coming up on the other side, we'll get you more news stories focusing particularly on what's playing out in the South. More updates, particularly on the Karnataka government forming a committee to consider making the Tulu language an official one. Pathan mania in January, Javan storm in June. Good to go, Chief. <laughs> and then, donkey tsunami in December. I don't care, Donkey. Donkey? Donkey ni Sharuk. Donkey. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> donkey. Three films in 12 months, all perfectly timed releases. That's Shah Rukh Khan for you all in 2023, the year when he rules like the king that he is. His third outing, Donkey, is as special as Pathan and Jawan. In fact, it even has interesting facts that one should know, starting with its title. Donkey translates to illegal entry or illegal immigration in Punjab. And as the name suggests, the film will highlight the rampant use of an illegal backdoor route called donkey flight that Indians undertake to migrate to countries like Canada and the USA. What's more, SRK wrapped up donkey in Saudi Arabia and also shared this video. There's nothing more satisfying than completing a shooting schedule as is with the Dunky here in Saudi, so I want to thank Raju sir, Abhijat, Manoj and the rest of the cast and crew for making it so lovely. And a special thanks to the Ministry of Culture and Films here in Saudi for giving us such spectacular locations, amazing arrangements and the warm hospitality. He even attended the Red Sea International Film Festival in 2022 wherein he spoke at length about the film and even explained the meaning of Dunky. SRK also shared what audience can expect from the film. Dunkey brings together two of the biggest forces of Indian cinema, filmmaker Rajkumar Hirani and SRK for the first time. The news was announced by Shah Rukh, which featured the superstar and the filmmaker revealing the name of their maiden project together. This is a dream come true moment, not only for the filmmaker actor duo, but also for fans of their work. Dunkey also marks SRK's first collaboration with Tapsi Pannu and she essays the female lead opposite him. While Jawan and Pathan are stylish actioners with grand scale, <laughs> Dunkey 
Donkey, which is slated to release on December 22nd, is touted to be a trademark Hirani film which will give a social message to the audience with an ample dose of comedy. So yes, King Khan has something different to offer to his fans in each of his films in 2023, the year that will go down in history for him. <laughs> Entertainment Bureau, India Today. Ready. Months to go for the elections in Karnataka and all parties are going all out to woo their vote banks. The Bombay government now has made a very interesting move. They've constituted a committee to recognize Tulu spoken in Dakshina Karnataka as the second official language of the state. The committee headed by an academician Mohan Alva is expected to submit the report to the state government within a week's time after which a decision will be taken by the Bombay government. She is one of India's most recognizable international faces. She has acted in films in languages that range from Hindi to Tamil to Telugu to Kannada to Malayalam to Bengali to even Hungarian, French and Italian. But did you know that none of these are Aishwarya Rai's native language? If you did not already know, it's the beautiful ancient language Tulu from coastal Karnataka. But why are we telling you about Aishwarya's mother tongue? Well, because the Bombay government in Karnataka has just set the ball rolling to give Tulu status as the state's second official language after Kannada. The government has finally formed a committee under the supervision of Mohan Alva to submit a report within one week to the state. With elections around the corner, the long pending demand of the people of coastal Karnataka is finally being fulfilled, the part of Karnataka which exported talent across the country and the globe. Native Tulu speakers number about 1.8 million and are concentrated in the coastal districts of Karnataka. Maathirla, smile maltondu. Tati Burundu, Matilla Mulpa Samman Malpanaga, patiently Kuldar Matra. But famous Tulu speakers are many. From Sunil Shetty to Shilpa Shetty to Pooja Higde to KL Rahul to Prakash Raj, Anushka Shetty, Kadri Gopal Nath to Sandeep Chota. Tulu is a rich and vibrant language with a distinct culture, literature, and traditions. The Tulu-speaking community has been demanding official recognition of their language for a long time. And they see this as a way to preserve their cultural heritage and promote their language. 
The demand for Tulu as an official language has been driven by a number of factors, including the growing number of Tulu-speaking people and their increased representation in the state's political and cultural landscape. Apart from the well-timed move right before elections, the recognition of Tulu as an official language could boost the local economy of an important part of Karnataka by creating job opportunities in language-related fields. Bureau Report, India Today. Moving on to some other stories, after the United Kingdom and Australia, another prominent Hindu temple this time has been targeted in Canada. This is in Brampton. It's um, known at this point the miscreants painted anti-India pro-Khalistani slogans on the walls of the Gauri Shankar temple, very similar to what we've been seeing in parts of Australia of late and also in the United Kingdom of temples being targeted of pro-Khalistani elements resorting to this kind of violence. After the United Kingdom and Australia, a prominent Hindu temple is now targeted with anti-India graffiti in Canada. The famous Gauri Shankar temple in Brampton, a symbol of Indian heritage, was vandalized with hate-filled messages. The Canadian authorities are investigating the incident. The attackers painted anti-India and pro-Khalistani slogans on the temple walls. Condemning the act of vandalism, the Indian Consulate General in Toronto said that the defacing of the temple has deeply hurt the sentiments of the Indian community in Canada. The defacing of the Hindu temple in Brampton is not an isolated incident. At least three similar acts of vandalism have been recorded in Canada since last July. pro khalistan elements are targeting temples in Australia too. Three incidents of Hindu temples being defaced were reported from Melbourne in January. Bureau Report, India Today. That's all we have time for in this edition of 6pm Prime. Thanks very much for tuning in. Coming up on the other side, I round up all the big political stories of the day. We'll be telling you all about what played out on day one of the budget session of Parliament. बनवास का टाइम खत्म हुआ एंड टाइम स्टार्ट्स विद पठान शाहरुख खान है शोन हु इज द रियल बादशाह ऑफ बॉलीवुड पठान के घर पे रखोगे तो मैं मानना बाजी के लिए पठान तो आया Shahrukh Khan's Pathan has finally ended Bollywood's dry season. Aur pata kya bhi laega. Leaving Bahubali and KGF2 far behind. Within two days of its release, Pathan has collected more than 216 crore worldwide. Pathan, Dhanta, Hunted. Within 48 hours, Pathan has shattered nearly 20 records. The film has collected more than 106 crores worldwide on the day of its release, which is more than any other Hindi film. It is now the biggest opener of King Khan's career. 
It is the fastest Hindi film to enter the 100 crore club. Pathan is the only Hindi film to touch 70 crore mark in a single day in India. Pathan became the only film in 32 years to have a houseful show in Kashmir Valley. According to trade experts, Pathan could surpass lifetime box office collection of Bahubali, The Conclusion and KGF2. As for the business, I think India alone, this film will cross 450 crore. Whether it crosses 500 crore is the only question now left to be answered. Looking at the craze among fans, the sky is the limit for Pathan. Bureau Report, India Today. A B.Tech graduate in Madhya Pradesh is scripting a success story in dairy farming. Anil Patidar from Modi village, located 45 kilometers away from Agar Malwa district headquarters, chose to stay close to his roots and started his dairy in 2018. I have done B.Tech in R.G.P. University in Bhopal. And today I have सोचा पहले कि जॉब में तो खुद का बिजनेस रहेगा नहीं दूसरों के अंडर में काम करना पड़ेगा मैंने डेरी फार्म स्टार्ट किया आठ गायों से मैंने शुरुआत की और आज मेरे पास 100 से 105 गायें हैं फ्रॉम कटिंग फोडर टू मिल्किंग काउस पार्टीदार रिलाइज ऑन मशीन्स टू मैनेज हिज बिजनेस द वेंचर दैट स्टार्टेड विद फोर काउस नाउ हैज मोर देन 100 the business he claims is making big profit. मेरे पास 600 से 700 लीटर दूध पर डे का रहता है। कितना हो रहा है आपने अब इसमें सर 60 40 का रेशो रहता है। मान लो जैसे कि 600 लीटर दूध है, 40 रुपए लीटर के हिसाब से जोड़ा अपन ने तो 24000 का दूध हुआ। इसमें 60 percent मेरी इनकम है और 40 percent मेरा हाँ Partidar claims one of the reasons to start his own dairy was to supply unadulterated milk. He claims many in the region are following his footsteps. Bureau Report, India Today. Ramesh, the arduous yatra is over. Kanya Kumari to Kashmir. What are the three big benefits you think this yatra has actually given your party today? Well, Rajdeep, don't reduce the yatra to an event. Uh, we are not event managers. The Bharat Jodo Yatra is a movement, and it's a long term movement and it's an ideological movement. But in terms of short term gains, if you're asking me that question, I think first and foremost, we have demonstrated a collective sense of purpose, a collective sense of solidarity in the Congress party organization. It has been enthused beyond imagination. And the younger generation of congressmen and congresswomen have really put their heart and soul together to make this yatra a grand success. So I think uh, a revival and rejuvenation of the Congress is certainly one very big gain. Mm -hmm. The second big gain, of course, is the fact that the real Mr. Rahul Gandhi, free from the social media insults and uh, distortions of his image that have taken place over the last eight years, has emerged and is visible to the people of the country. And the third big gain is that the Yatra, and Mr. Gandhi particularly, 
has highlighted in, through the Yatra the fact that we are now in an ideological battle mm -hmm. with the RSS and the BJP, the fact that we are fighting against economic inequalities, against social polarization, mm -hmm. and against political dictatorship. I think these are the issues that he has been able to highlight mm -hmm. through the length of this 136-day, 4,000-kilometer Yatra. But as he himself said this afternoon in Srinagar, this Yatra... Uh, was carried out by the Congress party. Uh, congressmen and women were involved in the Yatra, but he did this Yatra not for the party per se, but for the country, the to bring uh, the country together, mm -hmm. a fractured country, uh, the partition of the but minds, so to speak, that we have today because of social polarization. So I think these are some of the big gains in the Bharat Jodha Yatra. But the fact is, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, you are a political party and Rahul Gandhi is a politician. <clears throat> so there will be question naturally raised about whether this Yatra has brought you any political benefits. Even today in Srinagar, we didn't see uh, many of the opposition parties that you had invited even being there along with Rahul Gandhi as a show of solidarity. So the question arises, Does will this make the... Congress more electorally viable? Will it make it a magnet for opposition unity? None of those questions seem to have been addressed by the Yatra. These are questions in your mind, Rajdeep. And these are questions in the minds of a large army of armchair commentators who are prepared to write off the Congress party. This was the culmination of the Bharat Jodo Yatra in Srinagar on Monday. The journey of reinvention has seen many images, many faces of Rahul Gandhi. When he set out on the 4,000 km Yatra, a clean-shaven Rahul was the man on a mission. To unite the country was the stated agenda, but to tide over upcoming elections was the bigger goal. That goal required political muscle, so all Congress leaders put their weight behind the Gandhi air. If the aim of the Yatra was to showcase Rahul as a man fit to take on Modi in 2024, it was also to showcase his human side, the People Connect, the one loved by kids and youth alike. A family man, a doting son and a brother, an animal lover, a man who could walk with Aam Admi and the Khas Admi alike. A man of faith, a Shiv Bhakt, a secular face. As the Yatra continued, the beard started to grow. The look changed, but the white t-shirt remained, even in the biting Delhi cold. But then a jacket was added, later a cap and finally a fira. Whether these viral images translate into viral votes is something India will be waiting for and watching. Bureau Report, India Today. Good evening. You're tuned into Mission 2024 here on India Today. I'm Akshita Nandagopal, rounding up over the next 30 minutes all the big political stories of the day. Let's begin with the headlines. Adani Enterprises FPO gathers momentum, gets fully subscribed. Non-institutional investors portion booked 3.26 times. Economic survey tabled ahead of budget 2023. India remains the fastest growing economy amid global slump. Economy has gained what it lost during COVID. Ahead of 
budget session in Parliament, President Murmu addresses both houses, lobs government schemes and hails Nari Shakti in India. Today, today, our daughters and daughters उत्कल भारतीय के सपनों के अनुर विश्व स्तर पर आपने कीर्ति पता का लहरा रहे हैं। Politics over budget session. BRS and AAP boycott president's address. AAP calls President Murmu a puppet of Prime Minister Modi. हम लोगों ने राष्ट्रपति के अभिभाषण का बहिष्कार किया है और राष्ट्रपति का अभिभाषण वैसे भी सरकार के लिखे हुए झूठ का एक पुलिंदा होता है। Amid opposition's puppet attack, Prime Minister Modi hails President Murmo, calls on the opposition to debate and not just disrupt the budget session. Rastpati ji ka bhaashan Bharat ke samvidhan ka gaurav hai Bharat ki saunsadiya pranali ka gaurav hai Big statement by Andhra CM Jagan Reddy announces Vishakapatnam to be the new capital of Andhra, says he will move to Vizag soon. Here I am uh, to invite you to Vishakapatnam, which is going to be our capital. I myself would also be shifting over to Vishakapatnam in the months to come as well. So the budget will be presented tomorrow in Parliament. Today, the budget session of Parliament officially kicked off and it started with President Draupadi Murmu's uh, address to both the sittings, to the joint sitting of Parliament. And the opposition parties, however, have lashed out at President Murmu. There was politics that played out over her customary address to the joint session of Parliament. Amid its continued face-off of the central government, opposition parties, in fact, went after the President too and her speech in which she talked about several of the government schemes. You had AAP and BRS in particular boycotting the speech by the president. AAP MP Sanjay Singh called uh, president's speech a bundle of lies prepared by the central government. He further went on to state that the Aam Aadmi Party was boycotting these lies and that's why it didn't turn up for the address itself. Congress's Manish Tiwari also raised questions asking what is the purpose of the president's speech when she doesn't speak her mind, referring to the fact that she was reading the government's speech. Meanwhile, both BJP and Prime Minister Modi came to the defense of the president. The BJP slammed the opposition, accusing them of disrespecting the president by boycotting her speech. Prime Minister Modi, meanwhile, remarked that the president's speech is an opportunity to respect women and the great tribal traditions of the country. Narendra Modi ji, jawab nahi denge un karodon niveskon ko jo aaj chintit hain, jinhone LIC mein apna paisa lagaya hai. वो एसबीआई में जमा का पैसा जमा करने वाले लोग जो आज चिंतित हैं उनको जवाब नहीं देंगे प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी तो इसीलिए हम लोगों ने राष्ट्रपति के अभिभाषण का बहिष्कार किया है और राष्ट्रपति का अभिभाषण वैसे भी सरकार के लिखे हुए झूठ का एक पुलिंदा होता है राष्ट्रपति जी के अभिभाषण होते हैं सरकार जो चाहते हैं सरकार जो करते हैं वही राष्ट्रपति जी की भाषण में दोहराए जाते हैं तो स्वाभाविक रूप से राष्ट्रपति जी सरकार की बयान पेश करते हैं फिर भी हम राष्ट्रपति के अभिभाषण को काफी सम्मान देते हैं और राष्ट्रपति जी की भाषण के ऊपर जब चर्चा शुरू होगी सदन में परसों से तो हम लोग अपना बात रखेंगे उस समय आपको पता चलेगा कि हमारा हमारा विचार क्या है आपने एक छब्बीस जनवरी को राजपथ पर नहीं देखा क्या महिला सीआरपीएफ की परेड जो की बेस्ट परेड कंटिजेंट हुई क्या मिसाइल को ले जाने वाली लेफ्टिनेंट सेकंड लेफ्टिनेंट महिला थी एयर फोर्स की पायलट महिला थी जो खड़ी थी तो नारी शक्ति तो हम देख ही रहे हैं हमारे प्रधानमंत्री ने बेटी बचाओ बेटी पढ़ाओ को एक नई ऊंचाई दी और आज माननीय राष्ट्रपति जी का जो उद्बोधन हुआ वित्त मंत्री बजट पेश करेंगे लेकिन आज जो उनका उद्बोधन हुआ है वो देश के सर्वांगीण विकास का एक बहुत बड़ा परिचय है 
So the budget session kicked off today and will go on till April 6th. You had, in fact, uh, President Draupadi Murmu hailing the Modi government's achievements in her speech, as is usually the custom. She kicked off the parliament, the budget session. Murmu said the centre had taken steps against terror, including the abrogation of Article 370, the surgical strikes, as well as steps to empower women, like abolishing triple talaq. These were a few examples that she gave in her speech. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, speaking ahead of President Murmu's address, also in fact appealed to the opposition saying we hope that President Murmu gets a warm welcome. He also said that the budget will attempt to meet the hopes and aspirations of the common citizens and the entire world was looking at India with hope to revive the global economy, referring to the IMF projections. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman tabled the economic survey today, which hailed India as the fastest growing economy in the world. This survey has stated that the economy had gained what it lost during the COVID pandemic. Remember, tomorrow, Nirmala Sitharaman will be presenting the union budget. The centre overall in this budget session will introduce at least 36 bills, of which four bills on budgetary exercise will be brought out. आज एक तरफ देश में अयोध्या धाम का निर्माण हो रहा है तो वही तो वही दूसरी तरफ आधुनिक संसद भवन भी बन रहा है केदारनाथ धाम काशी विश्वनाथ धाम और महाकाल महालोक का निर्माण किया तो वही हर जिलों में हमारी सरकार मेडिकल कॉलेज भी बनवा रही है बीते वर्ष से भ्रष्टाचार के विरुद्ध निरंतर लड़ाई चल रही है हमने सुनिश्चित किया है कि व्यवस्था में ईमानदार का सम्मान होगा भ्रष्टाचारियों के लिए समाज में किसी भी प्रकार की सहानुभूति ना हो इसके लिए सामाजिक चेतना भी देश में बढ़ रही है बीते वर्षों में भ्रष्टाचार मुक्त इकोसिस्टम बनाने की दिशा में बेनामी संपत्ति अधिनियम को नोटिफाई किया गया है आर्थिक अपराध कर फरार हुए अपराधियों की संपत्ति जब्त करने के लिए पॉजिटिव इकोनॉमिक ऑफेंडर्स एक्ट पारित किया गया है सरकारी कामों में पक्षपात और भ्रष्टाचार के चलन को भी खत्म करने के लिए प्रभावी सिस्टम बनाया गया है ऐसा भारत हो जिसमें गरीबी ना हो जिसका मध्यम वर्ग भी वैभव से युक्त हो ऐसा भारत हो जिसकी युवा शक्ति और नारी शक्ति समाज और राष्ट्र को दिशा देने के लिए सबसे आगे घड़े खड़े हो जिसके युवा समय से दो कदम आगे चलते हो ऐसा भारत जिसकी विविधता और अधिक उज्जवल हो जिसकी एकता और अधिक अटल हो ये बजट सत्र में भी तकरार भी रहेगी लेकिन तकरीर भी तो होनी चाहिए और मुझे विश्वास है कि हमारे विपक्ष के सभी साथी बड़ी तैयारी के साथ बहुत बारीकी से अध्ययन करके सदन में अपनी बात रखेंगे भारत का बजट भारत के सामान्य मानवी की आशा आकांक्षाओं को तो पूरा करने का प्रयास करेगा ही लेकिन विश्व जो आशा की किरण देख रहा है उसे वो और अधिक प्रकाशमान नजर आए भारतीय जनता पार्टी के नेतृत्व में एनडीए सरकार उसका एक ही मकसद रहा है एक ही मोटो रहा है एक ही लक्ष्य रहा है और हमारी कार्य संस्कृति के केंद्र बिंदु में भी एक ही विचार रहा है इंडिया फर्स्ट सिटीजन फर्स्ट सबसे पहले देश सबसे पहले देशवासी 
Now, interestingly, in President Murmu's address earlier today, she also made a mention of the grand Ram Mandir being built in Ayodhya. The preparations for the inauguration of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya next year, in 2024, is on in full swing. Nepal has sent the auspicious Shaligram Shila, or the black stones, for the construction of the deities. The stones are tra traveling through Bihar before it actually reaches Uttar Pradesh, the final destination being Ayodhya. Rohit Singh has been traveling along the stones from Nepal Janakpur. He's filed this report for us. Three huge black auspicious stones known as Shaligram Shila are on their way from Nepal to Ayodhya. By certain claims, these are millions of years old and each of them weighs around 26 tons. Two huge pieces of a stone